Visions of the Black Heaven, written by Daniel Zine, read by Daniel Zine. Chapter 2. The sun's rays turned from dark amber to crimson red. Lengthening shadows devoured the skyline, hiding the city in a husk of darkness, yet allowing him one last glimpse of the vanishing light and his reflections in the window. Hans, dressed in a handsome gray pinstripe suit, confident, educated, stood facing the wall of windows in his office. Every night he made it a practice to watch the sun set over the city's horizon, watching the sun's rays slowly give way to the grip of darkness. He enjoyed watching the sun set, not to mark the end of a successful day, but to celebrate the coming of the night. For a few moments of every evening, the window's reflection showed both the setting of the sun over the city's landscape as well as reflections of the contents of his office. The reflections showed a large crystal chandelier eloquently suspended from a high ceiling. The chandelier's light revealed walls of display cases made of glass-covered birch, oak, and walnut wood. Each display contained a rare and unique item. Diamond rings and watches, a display of rare Roman coins, a haunted original Knights Templar sword, a crystal skull said to have been found in an ancient city in South America. A Roman's sword said to have been used to capture Christ at the crucifixion. A display of King Solomon's seals that legend says gives the holder special protection and powers over difficulties and challenges. A 20-inch long dagger and sheath made with an unknown metal and strange wooden handle. The article was identified with a strange type of writing on the sheath and blade. He had the dagger analyzed at a famous European college laboratory, only to have the results come back as inconclusive. They had never seen any metal like it before. There was a large bronze helmet as well, with the same writing as a dagger. Yet his most favorite and prized possessions were three gold medallions that his grandfather had purchased from a drifter at his office in Chicago. As the sun faded behind the landscape's horizon, the wall of reflections revealed the picture he was standing next to, a life-size portrait of the four men in his family, his grandfather, his father, himself, and his five-year-old son. On the opposite side of the portrait were the glass-covered case gold medallions that he proudly displayed on his desk. The medallions were all the same, but the medallions were also all different. Each medallion had two men, one warrior and one farmer. Each medallion had a picture of the solar system with a sun and 12 planets. Each medallion had a different configuration of planets. On the medallions behind the facial images were scenes of what appeared to be their world. One scene was that of a tropical forest with large foliage and fauna. Another scene looked like a desert. And a third almost looked like a scene of a seashore. Some of the letterings and images and plants on the medallion's pictures bore a striking resemblance and similarity to parts of a book called the Voynich Manuscript. On one picture he noticed a likeness of one of the warriors and himself, but never mentioned this to anyone. There was something special, something different, something unique about these medallions. Every time he held and looked at the medallions, he felt their presence. He had a sense of power, a sense of knowing what the future held. He experienced a sense of certainty in his actions and decisions. Hans grew up under the tutelage of his grandfather's ability to negotiate a deal on anything and everything. Hans knew this was why his grandfather was rich beyond anyone's imagination but never told anyone about this ability the medallions gave him. Looking at the medallions in the window's reflection, he remembered his son looking into the medallion's glass case, talking as if he were talking to someone. When he asked his son who he was talking to, his five-year-old pointed and said, To them, Papa, to them. Don't you see them? They're right there, Papa. He did not see them. He wondered if his son had an overactive imagination or if he really saw something. <laughs> okay, Hans said, and walked away. Looking back into his reflection once again, the reflections blurred for an instant. 
Then, as the reflections came back into focus, he saw his almost black eyes, protruding jawline, and thick set of teeth, so pronounced that for years he had to take speech lessons to learn how not to hiss when he spoke. He noticed reflections shimmering in the window. Shadows moved slowly in the reflections behind him. A voice whispered, La Chion de Four. He looked closer at his reflection. Something was different. His reflection had changed. He was different. The shadows behind him in the reflection moved faster. He heard it again. The voice sounding stronger, deeper, louder, speaking with greater authority and conviction, speaking the same phrase, La Chion de Four. He looked closer at his reflection. His whole image had changed. He was wearing different clothes. His face no longer had the expression of confidence and control, but he was snarling. He looked like he had two sets of teeth. His short blonde hair was now long and shaggy, hanging to his shoulders. His suit was replaced with some kind of short-sleeved leather and burlap garment. His arms were hairy and muscular, matching his powerful barrel chest. The leather and burlap were covered with armor metal that displayed the same solar system shown on the medallion. The shadows danced faster, silently jumping up and down as if excited by some unseen force. The sun disappeared behind the horizon. Before the illusions vanished, he smelled a scent of moist, decaying vegetation, a scent mixed with the stench of sweat. Once again, he heard the distant echoes of the same phrase and words. La Chille de He stood looking at the medallions, thought for a moment, then turned around, heading to the wall behind his desk. He set the alarm, stopped to look back at the darkness of the window, closed his office door, and left. Driving his car, he heard himself whispering, Find the keys. What did that mean? Find the keys. The keys to what? His thoughts flowed from one subject to another. Then he remembered the first visitor of the day. His assistant called on the telephone intercom. In a shaky voice, she announced the arrival of Voltarian Kotek. Standing in his favorite part of the office, in front of the windows overlooking the city, he methodically read a list of materials set for the next auction. Speaking into the telephone intercom system, but not taking his eyes off the list, Hans spoke in a controlled whisper. Tell him to come in, please. Out of the corner of his eye, he watched the client walk through the office door and straight to his desk. In an overbearing manner, he pointed to the glass-encased medallions, saying, My name is Voltarian Kotek. I want these. Will pay any price. Name your price. We'll pay anything. Name your price. Hans, still reading his list, looked up and saw a short, squat man with a shadowy aura dressed in a black suit with a woolen, full-length overcoat. He appeared more like a mythical gnome than a man. He was sure that this man was not accustomed to hearing the word no. Hans spoke in a cool manner. My name is Hans Schroeder III. They're not for sale. What else may I help you with? He went back to reading his list. No, 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 shouted the client. You not understand. I want these. We'll pay any price. I have to have these. Name your price. Hans replied in a calm tone of finality. They're not for sale. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. That is final. What else may I help you with? The gnome-like man inhaled deeply and held his breath as if he were about to argue his point. After a long moment of silent contemplation, he released his breath, and Hans watched as this Voltarian Coltec turned around and hastily stormed out of his office. Hans was surprised at the insistence of the client, his sense of urgency and determination. Walking back to his desk, he sat down, opened the bottom drawer, and retrieved his grandfather's diary. He placed the worn and tattered leather-bound book before him on his desk, the book open to a page that had been read many times before. 
The Diary of Hans Schroeder I, Business Transactions of December 21st, 1897.